to your info. We love it and we'll it'll show up in um in the uh later when we re when we re when we post it online. But um, because of the time difference, we had a, a, a little bit of a snafu and um, Mark Brazil is going to need to um, start right away. We are going to have our general meeting after Mark's talk. So please stick around. We have some very important announcements and um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Margie. Oh, and let me just give a couple reminders about um, if you have a question for the speaker, please put it in Q&A and we'll be sure to check that afterwards. Um, if there's anything logistic wise you need, put it in chat. We will be monitoring that. And um, I think that's about it. Take it away, Margie. So I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Mark Brazil, talking about birds of Japan. And to be completely, let's see, completely clear, um, this was something that I personally really wanted to do. Uh, some of you may not know that I ran an international headhunting business between Tokyo and Manhattan uh, for a very long time. I speak fluent Japanese and spent a lot of my 20s actually in Tokyo and, and Japan traveling all around. So it's my agenda coming up here to finally get back to Japan to bird at some point. So, uh, but I'm thrilled that I have um, Dr. Brazil to talk to us because he's so well known in Japan and throughout actually East Asia, he's published uh, the, the most important birds of East Asia uh, by Princeton, the sort of the number one birding guide uh, for the East Asian area, which includes what China and Taiwan, Russia, actually Korea. Um, anyway, uh, he's a noted ornithologist. He was born in England. He's lived in Japan since 1998. He's a natural historian as well as an ornithologist. He's a nature guide, and he's an author noted for, as I say, all of his work on East Asian, and especially more recently, uh, all kinds of uh, books and nature books about Japan. His most recent book is, you can see I have a lot of them here, uh, Japan, the Natural History of an Asian Ar Archipelago, right here. And he's written a bird watcher's guide to Japan. He's just got so many cool books. And so we're very lucky to have him. He's very game to be speaking to us from Hokkaido, where I understand it got very cold overnight. Uh, so he's got his stove heated, fired up, and he's ready to talk to us. So he's going to um, also, he, he I just want to say, he leads many nature-based tours in Japan and actually around the world and has been doing so since 1983. So uh, if there's time at the end, um, I'd like to have him tell us a little bit about when is the best time to visit Japan. Because we don't, everybody thinks he's saying that every we need to go to Japan in the frigid winter in Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island, but we don't need to do that, do we? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> take it away, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, well, bear with me whilst I uh, go through this uh, process of trying to get set up. And um, I'll be with you in just a few minutes. I hope. I don't want you to think you're alone. We are all here. Is there that working? Um, yep. yep. But somehow That's you. Great. Okay. There you okay. Go. Like, awesome. Yeah, I think I think I'm on the uh, the first slide. So welcome everyone. I uh, thought I was going to be speaking only to people in Florida. Um, so hello to everyone in Florida. Um, but I gather there are people uh, listening and watching um, today, this morning here for me in Japan, uh, people from uh, all over. So uh, it's great to have you here. 
Um, I started with just some iconic images of Japan just to uh, set the scene. We've got uh, cherry blossoms floating um, on water. We've got the famous uh, Hokusai wave um, with that lovely little view of Mount Fuji uh, in the distance. And then um, moving on, I have this uh, classic photograph, contemporary image of Mount Fuji taken by uh, my birding friend, Chris Cook. And I use this as the opening shot for that recent book that uh, Margie just showed you, The Natural History of Japan. Um, what I want to do today, uh, of course, uh, talk to you about birds, but for me, um, Japan and birds is more than just about watching birds, um, because the fact that Japan was isolated for so many centuries means that the process through which we've learned about Japan is also very interesting. And knowledge about the um, natural history, the avifauna of a foreign country today seems so easy. You just go online, you just order the field guide. There's a field guide to everywhere. That wasn't true when I first came to Japan. Um, I first came here in 1980. And um, it was a real challenge getting information. And uh, I spent two and a half years here in the early 80s um, and then went back to the UK. And after careers in conservation and natural history television in the UK and New Zealand, I ultimately moved back to Japan in 1998. So my home base has been in Hokkaido. Um, and then in 2018, my wife and I moved to East Hokkaido, where we now live in the Akan Mashu National Park. So uh, I may be known to you already, perhaps as an author, perhaps as a specialist on Asian wildlife. Um, but today um, I would like to discuss the Japanese avifauna, You'll be intrigued by that, but also the history of the natural history of what is for many an unfamiliar and rather exotic country. Typically, at this stage in a talk, I'd be asking for a show of hands. How many of you have been to Japan? How many of you want to go to Japan? But on a webinar, that's a little bit tricky. Um, so I'm going to assume that some of you have been, that most of you haven't. Um, and that many of you would like to visit Japan. So what I want to do is give you a somewhat convoluted history of how it is we learned about the birds of Japan and also give a backstory to how and why I came to write books about Japan, particularly a field guide to the birds of Japan, which was published back in 2018. Um, the species that are on screen at the moment will be um, explained later if you're not already familiar with the uh, the Priors woodpecker, the Okinawa rail, Stella sea eagle and the red crowned crane. I'll show you much more of them later. Um, I think everyone will have a rough idea at least of the location of um, Japan, this island nation of the East Asian coast. And given its proximity to the continent, you can compare Japan in a way with, say, the British Isles and Europe or New Zealand with Australia. But in most ways, geographically, geologically, culturally and naturally, Japan is very dramatically different. Um, but it is an island country, so it shares many of those aspects of island biology uh, that are familiar to us from other parts of the world. Um, and I'd like to set the scene just in case Japanese geography is unfamiliar to you, um, because Japan has got almost 7,000 islands. And the four largest of these in order of size are Honshu, which is often referred to as the mainland of Japan. Um, then up in the north is uh, Hokkaido, and down in the south, Kyushu. And then the smaller, the fourth of the, um, the main islands, Shikoku, is tucked under the western part of Honshu there. 
But there are literally thousands of smaller islands scattered around the four main islands. Um, but particularly from an ornithological point of view, several subsidiary island groups are really important to us. And I'm going to uh, mention these later in my talk. The, um, the, the upper of those three circles um, that shows the Izu Islands, the lower one on the right, the Ogasawara and Iwo Islands. So that, that island chain stretches a thousand kilometers, more than 600 miles out into the Pacific. And then the large ring on the, uh, the lower left there indicates the southwesternmost islands of Japan between Kyushu and Taiwan. And then the red dot um, up in the east, that's where I'm talking to you from. It's um, a cold, frosty morning here in Hokkaido, um, and I'm living in East Hokkaido, very close to uh, volcanoes and crater lakes, uh, so wonderful uh, scenery nearby. But moving on, um, Japan's geological and geographical history is richly diverse and fascinating, but it's the subject of an entirely different lecture that I often give on expedition, expedition cruise ships. Um, so today, all I'd like to say or to remind you is that Japan is located on the Pacific Ring of Fire. That means it has numerous volcanoes. It has an uplifted mountain range that forms the spine of the main island. In fact, multiple separate mountain ranges. And then just offshore, it has a deep oceanic trench. So thanks to the location and the geology, Japan's habitats range from high alpine tundra in the mountains of Hokkaido and Honshu, and from boreal forest in the far north and at high elevations, all the way through to subtropical forest, to mangroves and coral reefs in the south. So the only major habitat that Japan lacks is dry desert. It has pretty much everything else. And I've just added in a picture there, you'll see at the lower left, an image of a rock ptarmigan I took in the Japan Alps um, back in the summer. Just as a reminder that uh, in Japan, the avifauna is extremely diverse. It has species that are restricted to Japan, some of them restricted just to individual islands, but it also has species that range very widely around the Northern Hemisphere. And in the uh, high mountains of Honshu, the rock ptarmigan is a kind of relict species. Well, I think that today Japan is widely known as offering one of the top winter bird watching and wildlife ph photography destinations on earth. Numerous tour companies, especially photographic tour companies, target Hokkaido. Um, but it's also steadily becoming recognized as a great destination for adventure travel and even hosted the Adventure Travel World Summit just two months ago, which was hosted here in Hokkaido. So this northern island of Hokkaido, where I live, plays a very significant role in the reputation of Japan as a key destination for winter birding, winter wildlife. And I'd like to think that um, my many articles and books, radio and TV programs about, about Japan since the early 1980s have also contributed to Japan's fame. Sea ice is one of those key images that people associate with winter in Hokkaido. And uh, if anyone has a question about that, I'll be very happy to talk about sea ice um, after um, this talk. And of course, the iconic species that are um, part of every winter trip here include the gatherings of hooper swans that migrate in from Russia, the red-crowned cranes that are resident here in Hokkaido, uh, the Stella's sea eagle, which migrates in from the north shore of the Sea of Okhotsk or from Kamchatka, um, and then the wonderfully enormous Blakiston's fish owl, um, a bird with a remarkable ecology um, and one that uh, hangs on by a thread here in Hokkaido. 
Well, this is a season that perhaps some of you may have visited Japan, um, and it's the time when large iconic species are the order of the day. Um, the red-crowned crane in the area of the Kushiro Wetlands National Park. Here you can see them at their river roost in the, uh, the center image. Um, and then to the left, we have uh, Stella's eagle, which was the first Asian bird that excited me when I was a child. Arguably, it's the most dramatic of all the eagles. It dwarfs the white-tailed eagle, which is about the size of your bald eagle in North America. Um, and it draws numerous bird watchers from around the world to visit Hokkaido each winter. Little did I know as a child that one day I would live where they occasionally fly over my house. Now, I'm not a lister, um, but I do keep a list of birds I've seen from my outdoor hot spring, my Rotemboro, and Stella's eagle is on that list, as is the next species, Blakiston's fish owl. One of the world's rarest birds, and arguably the largest owl, is another species that generates great excitement among visiting international birders. However, to understand our modern fascination with Japan and its bird life, I'd like to delve back into the history of a country that was closed to the outside world for several centuries. Modern Japan remains steeped in an ancient culture spanning several thousand years. And there are many echoes of that ancient culture in the ways that Japanese people relate to nature today. And during the feudal era of Japan, which lasted late into the 19th century, animism, folklore, mythology, and folk biology were blended to an extraordinary degree. This lasted well into the modern era, even today. And species are often referenced as deities themselves or messengers of the pantheon of Shinto and, Shinto and Ainu deities. This mythology is reflected in names and beliefs, and there are stories of fabulous creatures from dragons and phoenix, as depicted here on the left and lower right, to cranes and mischievous water sprites known as kappa. Well, there are dragons here in Japan, mythologically associated with water, with the rivers and the seas, but you'll notice they don't have wings, unlike Western dragons. Um, and somehow, paradoxically, the dragon is also associated with the sun, a creature of the sun associated with fire. So this is one of those strange paradoxes of Japan. It's the dragon is associated with water and fire, but as anyone who's lived here knows, Japan is a land of inexplicable paradoxes. The iconic red-crowned crane is mythologically the bird of happiness and longevity, considered to live for a thousand years. Its image is frequently found at shrines, and here it is beneath the imperial chrysanthemum emblem. And it's also depicted on lavish wedding kimono and in commercial, commercial advertising. So it's a species that we see regularly um, while traveling around Japan, whether in reality or in advertising. Two other folk creatures regularly encountered today in Japan, uh, this one on the right, the shachihoko, a creature of the sea, part fish, part dolphin, part sea serpent. And as so, it provides protection against fire. So it's placed at each end of the roof ridge on traditional tiled houses, roofed houses, suggesting that the entire house is protected below the water. And also on the left, you'll see this strange human, humanoid river sprite known as Kappa, about which there are many local and regional tales. But that's enough of my mythological digression. Let's just digress a little bit um, into the history of natural history in Japan. I've mentioned the closure of Japan, and because of that closure, Japan's links to the outside world were extremely limited for hundreds of years. 
So one place and one place above all becomes very significant. And that's a tiny island off the coast of Kyushu in Nagasaki prefecture called Dejima. This artificial island was built in 1636 and measures a mere 120 meters by 75 meters long. And it was built specifically for international trade, but to keep traders and the Japanese population apart. So for more than 200 years, this tiny enclave was the narrow doorway through which Japan learned about the outside world and through which the rest of the world began to learn about Japan. And that includes Japan's natural history and its bird life. The Dejima trading post required a physician. And of course, historically, physicians were often naturalists or botanists, collectors, or all three. And many of them have left no trace at all. But three in particular sent shockwaves out into the Western world and inwards into Japan with that exchange of information. So it's through these physicians of Dejima that we came to know about the Western world, that Japan came to know about the Western world, and we came to know about the fascinating culture, the natural history, the fauna and avifauna of Japan. So we owe a huge debt to those early naturalists of Japan's closed period. And everything that I have ever written about Japan, I'm very closely aware of the fact that there's a great history of spread of information that I've been dependent on. And the first of these names that I'd like to introduce you to is Kaibara Eken who studied amongst the physicians at Dejima from 1649 to 1656 and wrote what was the first published natural history of Japan. It revolutionized the steps in our understanding of Japan. And in his 21 volumes, he wrote one about birds in which he described 99 species. In effect, this was the first published guidebook to Japanese birds, and it predated Thomas Buick's History of the Birds of Britain by 90 years, and it predated John James Audubon's Birds of America by more than 110 years. So a really influential figure who was known as the Aristotle of Japan. Well, the first of the famous physicians that came to Dejima was this man, Engelbert Keimfer. Um, like um, others I'm going to introduce, he was stationed there on behalf of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, uh, just for two years at a time when travel outside that tiny island was extremely limited, not just for him, not just for foreigners, but also for Japanese. But he collected numerous species and um, he found, for example, the, the famous ginkgo biloba growing in Japan. And one particular species, the Japanese larch, was named after him. And it will be familiar to any of you who've traveled in northern Japan. He wrote and was published posthumously um, a book about Imperial Japan, which included various accounts of birds. And uh, he then provided the basis of knowledge for the next famous um, Westerner who came to Dejima. Now, this was Tunberg, the Swedish naturalist. He had studied under the great master of taxonomy, Linnaeus, at Uppsala University, and became his most famous student. Like Keimfer, he was in Dejima just for two years, but he too collected specimens, sent specimens back to Europe, including of many species of birds and many new species of insects and plants. Then I'd like to introduce this person, Ono Ranzan. He published the most com comprehensive treatise on natural history for a hundred years, influenced by Kaibara and by Linnaean approach to natural history introduced by Tunberg. 
He wrote 48 volumes on the natural studies um, of Japan and included two volumes devoted to birds. And just to indicate these illustrations on either side, not from his publication, but from other publications of the 17th century, just to show how advanced, how accurate and how beautiful illustrations of the period were. For those of you interested in Japanese bird art, it's been attractive and highly distinctive and very accurate uh, for many centuries, but it still reflects that folk biological approach of the almost mythical period of Japan's natural history. Note, for example, on the right, this conjunction of the red-crowned crane with the pine. Um, the red-crowned crane, a symbol of longevity, the pine, a symbol of strength, and also notice in the background those peonies. We could easily take them as just a little artistic um, attraction, a little color in the background, but they too similar, symbolize long life. They're even a motif of immortality. And here in this illustration of white-naped cranes, which today we associate with uh, the southern Japan, uh, you'll notice this very unusual aspect of Japanese art, the complete lack of shadows. Well, moving on, the third of the famous Westerners at Dejima was this man, uh, Philip Franz von Siebold. He had the greatest international reputation um, and adding his name to Keimfer and Tunberg, these three are affectionately known as the three scholars of Dejima. He built on the works of his predecessors. And of course, at this time, Japan was expressing greater and greater interest in medical knowledge, in scientific knowledge, and learning about other countries. And so he was eventually granted extended access beyond the confines of Dejima. Mostly life on Dejima was like being in an internment camp, but he was able to travel more widely through Kyushu and Honshu on collecting exp expeditions. And also collectors brought in um, items to him, which he was able to trade for um, medical knowledge or medical treatment. And his specimen collection, which was sent back to Europe, um, was the basis for an extraordinary series of books, the Fauna Japonica, which um, used his specimens and included 175 species of birds. Today, uh, he's rather little known in Europe or North America, but in Japan, he's very well known and revered as a great naturalist uh, and after whom several species are named. So we have in the center there, we have Seabolds, Magnolia. Um, he was the person who sent the very first specimen of the Japanese giant salamander, which is as big as an otter. Uh, he sent that back to Europe. And also uh, after him, we have uh, a very important endemic bird, the white-bellied green pigeon, uh, which is named Treron Siboldi after him. Well, for centuries, Tiny Dejima was the only conduit through which information could flow between isolated Japan and the West. But during the mid and late 19th century, there was political upheaval in Japan. And this ultimately led to the restoration of the Meiji Emperor um, as the Tokugawa Shogunate lost power. And we have a key date for that restoration of 1868, which is arguably the most critical date for modern Japan. Many things changed, including an increased freedom of movement for Japanese people, and a number of additional ports were opened for trade. And that, of course, changed the rate at which we began to learn about Japan. Now, one of the key figures um, and a very important person from my point of view was this man, uh, Thomas Wright Blakiston, who was able to move to Hokkaido, especially to Hakodate, 
And he was a merchant and set up a wood milling business here. And he was a typical Victorian era naturalist from Britain. Um, perhaps you know the hunter's phrase, what's hit is history, what's missed is mystery. Well, that defines his time. It was all about going out and collecting specimens. Now, at the same time that he was in Hakodate, um, traveling then by horseback over tracks and trails, there were no roads in Hokkaido, Hokkaido at that time, but he was corresponding with a man in Yokohama by the name of Henry Pryor, actually an entomologist, but also a collector, and had numerous species of uh, birds which he'd collected. And together, Blakiston and Pryor compiled a catalogue of the birds of Japan, which was published in the prestigious journal Ibis in 1878. And they were able to include 295 species. Now, their specimens were being sent back to the British Museum, where the curator, Henry Seabom, in 1890, published Birds of the Japanese Empire based on their work and now included 381 species. So our knowledge of the avifauna of Japan was steadily growing. Also growing was an understanding that the, the plant life, the animal life, the bird life of Hokkaido was more closely related to that of Northern Asia. Whereas the species of Honshu and further south were more closely related to Southern Asia. And this fundamental difference between these regions was recognized in 1887 uh, and described as Blakiston's line after Blakiston, who had collected a significant number of the specimens that had shown this difference. And so to this day, we think of that deep water strait, the Tsugaru Strait between Hokkaido and Honshu as being Blakiston's line. Species like the brown bear and the Blakiston's fish owl occur north of the line. And south of the line, there are a number of endemic birds and the Japanese macaque, for example, that only occurs south of Blakiston's line. Well, with the rapid modernization of Japan, the expansion of its empire and the new freedom of movement, it became the turn of Japanese scientists to move to the forefront of ornithological research in Japan and beyond because their empire, of course, extended down into other parts of Asia. Um, so it's very difficult from this period onwards to tie down exactly how many species were known from the Japan that we recognize today. But significant amongst these men, and even to this day, most Japanese ornithologists are men, um, this man, Dr. Ijima Isao, um, was one of the co-founders of the prestigious Ornithological Society of Japan and its first president. Um, and I am now one of the editors of this journal. Well, he was immortalized in the name of an endemic breeding species, uh, Ijima's leaf warbler. And part of what makes the avifauna of Japan so uh, exotic sounding is the fact that there are many eponymous species, species named after famous people, both in Japanese and in English, and also in the scientific names. So there's an interweaving of history in the ornithology of the country, which has been fascinating to unravel. Well, the latter half of the 20th century saw a proliferation of scientific studies and publications about birds, all in Japanese, of course. Well, the first English language guide was published by Prince Yamashina um, in 1961, and in its second edition, it included just 280 species. Uh, in the top right, you can see an image of Prince Yamashina in his office at what became known as the Yamashina Institute for Ornithology. He has a crested ibis um, just behind his right shoulder, 
and a green pheasant above, an endemic green pheasant above his left shoulder. And this was the book that I had as reference when I first visited Japan in 1980 in February. And it's one of the reasons that I was inspired to study and write about the Japanese avifauna, which is a task that has occupied me ever since. By the time of my second visit to Japan in 1982, uh, the Wild Bird Society of Japan had published the first ever compact field guide in English, which also included distribution maps and now included 537 species. Um, if any of you visited Japan um, in the 80s, 90s, or even into the early 2000s, this may well have been a book that you used. And it was thanks to the Wild Bird Society of Japan um, and the fact that I had spent um, a couple of years hitchhiking the length and breadth of Japan, taking ferries and hiking and exploring, um, that I was asked to write this book, A Bird Watcher's Guide to Japan. Now, in the 80s, Japan was a very expensive bubble era country. Um, there was very little information available in English. And I was a contact person for anyone who wanted to visit Japan. So I was continually writing uh, the same letters over and over to people explaining where they could go. And so I started writing uh, small publications about regions of Japan and then finally culminated in that Birdwatcher's Guide to Japan explaining about the whole country. Well, my interest in the changing status um, of birds here led me to write a handbook which was to commemorate the centenary of sea bones, birds of the Japanese empire. It was a partly illustrated handbook, mainly about status and distribution of the 583 species then considered to have occurred in the archipelago. But this was a time of rapid change. And with the popularity of photography, and especially the fact that in Japan, bird watchers have always been few in number and photographers have greatly outnumbered them. And then with the advent of digital photography, there's been a rapid change in the availability of Japanese, um, of images of Japanese birds. And that has led to a proliferation of field guides in Japanese published quite rapidly over the last 20 years. But just look at the titles of these books and you'll notice the prominence. You may not read the title, but you'll read the numbers. Look at the prominence of the numbers. We go from 550, 590, 650, 670. And we might easily imagine that these were the total numbers of birds known from Japan at those times. But actually, that's the number of species that were illustrated in those books, not recorded from the country. Nevertheless, they are useful guides, but I've always been in fan, a fan of illustrative artwork rather than field, gui uh, field guides illustrated by photographs. And I grew up in Europe with a field guide to the birds of Europe, which gave me an eye-opening image of the birds that were potential to visit the British Isles where I lived. So my initial field guide project was this one, the Birds of East Asia that Margie already mentioned, and it hadn't previously been covered by a single field guide. So what has happened in the last 15 years? Well, Japan has gone from being merely an exotic and extremely expensive destination for birding, accessible just to a few people, to a destination that's now listed by most bird tour companies and photographic tour companies. Um, and that has led to a dramatic change in um, local and regional tourism. Well, with over 750 species now recorded from Japan, the diversity, the avian diversity of the archipelago is quite clear. New vagrants are found most years. 
But of more interest, I think, to visiting birders is the diversity in the resident and regular summer and winter migrants here. Winter birding has become so popular that Japan is in danger of being typecast as a country of eagles, owls, and swans. However, as with most northern hemisphere areas, the months of April, May, and June provide fantastic opportunities to watch spring migrants arriving and to enjoy breeding seabirds. This image is of shearwaters, short-tailed shearwaters that migrate to the shore, uh, or at least the, the southern sea of Okotsk, just off Hokkaido in early summer. We have spectacled um, guillemot on the left and tufted puffin on the right, breeding seabirds in Hokkaido. But there are also a host of other species that come here in summer. Uh, flycatchers and thrushes, we've got the blue and white flycatcher, the Japanese and Siberian thrushes, and Narcissus flycatcher, and the Siberian ruby throat, and the Japanese robin, and so on, and lower uh, images. So summer is a fantastic time for birding in Japan. So although it's been typecast as a winter birding destination, Japan actually offers fantastic birding around the year. I want to take you now briefly on a journey through Japan with its birds from Hokkaido in the north to Nansei Shoto in the south. Hokkaido has a well-deserved reputation for high quality winter birding, but its summer attractions include breeding species like these at the top, the white-tailed eagle, Pacific swift, the black woodpecker, and Latham snipe. And then amongst the, the smaller passerines, we have the chestnut-eared bunting, the colourful long-tailed rosefinch, black-browed reed warbler, and middendorf's grasshopper warbler. So many uh, exotic Asian, East Asian species um, that are attractive for summer visitors to tourist visitors to Japan. Well, Japan's main islands south of Lakeston's line, um, Honshu. Kyushu and Shikoku have certain endemic species, such as this wonderful copper pheasant, that don't occur on Hokkaido to the north or on the island south of Kyushu. There's the copper pheasant, the green pheasant, the Japanese woodpecker, as well as many amphibians, reptiles and mammals, uh, including the world famous Japanese macaque or snow monkey. So that Blakiston's line is an important thing to keep in mind when understanding the avifauna of Japan or the mammal uh, fauna of Japan. In winter, Japan's southern main island of Kyushu is home to an enormous gathering of around 15,000 hooded and white-naped cranes and many other rare East Asian species such as Saunders gull and black-faced spoonbill. It's also where the white-bellied green pigeon, named after Seabold, can be found in winter. But in addition to the main islands, as I mentioned earlier, there are many other islands. And just off the main island of Honshu in the Sea of Japan is an island called Sado, which is best known among Japanese people for the world famous Kodo drummers. Perhaps you've seen them on tour. They've visited America many times. Uh, but to birders, it's renowned as the place to see Japan's living phoenix, the crested ibis. It was once extinct in the wild, but captive breeding and release is now helping the population rise from the ashes of extinction and recover. And thankfully now there are more than 400 in the wild. This is the ultimate Japanese bird, given its scientific name, Nipponia nippon. And it's extraordinary in this shift from uh, winter plumage white uh, to the dark gray of breeding plumage, which is not through molt, but it's through um, preening in of oils into the plumage. A beautiful bird, which also has this wonderful suff suffusion of pink or um, orange in the feathers, 
um, which has a distinctive Japanese name for that um, color. This bird is Toki in Japanese, and that color is Toki Iro, the color of Toki. We're looking at other islands now off the main islands of Japan. Um, as I mentioned, Japan is on the Pacific Ring of Fire, where at least four tectonic plates meet. So just to the east of Honshu, the Pacific plate subducts below the Asian plate. And as a result, there are numerous volcanoes on the main islands and offshore. And among these are the volcanic islands known as the Izu Island Group. And here we find birds such as the Izu Robin on the lower right, the Izu Thrush in the middle, and Austens or Izu Tit at the top left, and then Ijima's Warbler on the lower left. If we could carry on directly south from the Izu Islands, if we could take a boat further south, we would then pass on our way to the Ogasawa Islands. We would pass Horishima, literally Bird Island. This is where the short-tailed albatross, the rare albatross of the Pacific, um, bred. Um, alas, in 1949, it was uh, declared extinct following a period of over-collecting for its feathers and destruction of its breeding grounds by a volcanic eruption. But since its rediscovery and active conservation efforts, the population has recovered from what were just a few individuals to nearly 7,000 birds today. A thousand chicks were counted in the 2021 to 2022 breeding season. So we can look forward to more sightings of this bird around the um, North Pacific and up into the Bering Sea. So a bird that is recovering, like the uh, toki, the crested ibis on Sado Island, one of the most beautiful of all the seabirds. These islands to the, to the south, Ogasawa Islands, also have their endemics, and the most famous one of those would be um, this small passerine, the Bonin uh, white eye, as it's now known, the Bonin honey eater, as I always think of it, as that's what it's been known during most of my ornithological career. But switching from those islands south of Tokyo, um, now let's look at the Southwest Islands, which lie between Kyushu and Taiwan. This uh, region is known as the Nansei Shoto. And here we have three separate groups of islands, the Amami group in the north, the Okinawa group in the center, and the Yayama group in the far Southwest. This island chain is a fascinating region for biologists because it's in the transition zone between the, um, the boreal northern temperate and southern temperate region and then the tropical subtropical region. It's where many northern species reach their southern limits and where many southern species reach their northern limits. So, for example, we would find Malayan night heron and purple heron here at their very northernmost limits. But there are also places where rare migrants turn up during um, spring and autumn. I've just shown here a few of the endemic species of the, uh, of the different island groups. And I'll mention those again uh, as I look at each one of these separately. That island chain has some species that are endemic to the entire chain or more readily found there than anywhere else, such as the Japanese wood pigeon and the Ryukyu green pigeon on the right. Um, amongst my favorites um, in this island group and occurring on multiple islands through the chain are the Ryukyu robin and the Ryukyu scopsal. So Amami Oshima, the northernmost of the islands in that Southwest Island group, this is a biodiversity hotspot. Whether you're interested in amphibians or reptiles, birds or mammals, there are endemics here. 
Um, for example, this um, Ishikawa's frog, this beautiful frog about the size of my hand, uh, is endemic just to the Amami Island group. In terms of birds, the forest here is home to the Lids jay and to Austin's woodpecker or the Amami woodpecker. Um, it also hosts the Amami woodcock and the Amami thrush. And it's a good place to look uh, at night for species such as the ruddy kingfisher, a more widely ranging migrant. If we move on south to the Okinawa main island, just to the west of Okinawa, we've got the Kerama Islands, wonderful places, by the way, for watching uh, whales, humpback whales migrate there. But the Okinawa uh, Islands are essentially uplifted coral um, atolls with elevations rising only to 640 meters, so relatively low uh, islands. And today they support subtropical forest with a rather uniform canopy. And although they're separated only by 250 kilometers from Amami Oshima, they've been isolated long enough to have their own endemic species. In particular, um, these three, the Priors woodpecker or Okinawa woodpecker on the left, the Okinawan robin, which has only recently been recognized as a full species. And then on the right, the Okinawa rail, which was first described to science only in 1981. And all of these species occur in a biodiversity hotspot at the north of the main island of Okinawa, um, known as Yambaru. That's a fantastic area for birding. Well, the southwesternmost islands, and in fact, all of these islands in this chain have been connected and disconnected several times as sea levels have risen and fallen over several million years. And it's this repeated isolation that has led to the evolution of numerous endemic species here in situ. And the last island in the chain, the Ayama group, um, has those same species which occur throughout the, the region, Ryukyu scopsal, Ryukyu green pigeon, Ryukyu minivet, but also several endemic taxa, including Ori's tit in the lower left, Ishigaki tit in the top right, the Ryukyu serpent eagle, and also the regional Malayan night heron. Now, the recognition of these different taxa varies depending on whether you're a Japanese ornithologist or a Western ornithologist, some of whom disagree as to whether they're full species or subspecies, but nevertheless, it makes for a fascinating region to visit. Uh, there's even um, a local endemic population of the um, uh, local cat from Southeast Asia. Anyway, after first visiting Japan in 1980, my dream was to produce a modern field guide inspired by those three scholars of Dejima and by Seabom's um, Compendium of the Birds of, um, of the Japanese Empire. I'd spent a lot of time distracted in writing the field guide to the birds of East Asia. And that had taken me so long that it took me a further 10 years before I could actually produce my field guide to the birds of Japan, covering all 747 species known in Japan at that time. So given my rate of progress in writing books, I figure that there might only be time for me to, uh, to work on one more. So uh, I, I have something up my sleeve but um, that remains to, uh, to be decided amongst the publishers. But whilst I was writing my last book, writing the introduction to the field guide to the birds of Japan, I became fascinated by the geography, the climate and the biogeography of Japan and explaining how that related to the distribution of species. And so that's how I came to write um, Japan, the natural history of an Asian archipelago. Well, for the time being, I'm resting from writing projects, 
but I never tire from going out birding in Japan and leading visitors here in search of Japan's natural history. And my next birding tours around Japan and Hokkaido will be for Victor Emanuel Nature Tours next January and June. And my next cultural tour will be for Geo Expeditions in April next year. So perhaps I'll see one or more of you here in Japan one day. Thanks very much for listening. Wow, what a, what a fascinating, <clears throat> inspiring, and beautifully presented talk. I, I, I love that you included the history. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, for me, it's the crucial element to understanding how we came to know this much about Japan. We, as I said, we take it for granted that there are field guides to everywhere now, but that wasn't always the case. And every publication is just one step on the ladder as we learn more and more about the birds or the animals of a region. Well, Mark, my, my original... Um study of Japan was the language, but it was also the history of Japan at Harvard Graduate School. So I love that you did the history and then let us into the birds or the, the whole, it was a wonderful presentation and very inspiring. I'm drooling. I can hardly wait to get back to Japan and hopefully meet you in person. Well, so we have you. questions. Let's see, Q&A here. We're getting lots of thanks. Yes. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, um, I should add that I am not a linguist. And so when I first came to Japan and discovered that none of the uh, publications in Japan had English names, and almost none of them had scientific names, my first vocabulary was the Japanese names for the birds that occurred here. And then I discovered that most Japanese people don't know those names. <laughs> So my first vocabulary was completely useless. Uh, interesting. We do have a question. Suzanne asks, can you say a little more about why you prefer illustrated images over photos? Uh, it's a very uh, interesting question about uh, our taste. Of course, digital imagery has become so available now, um, but I still feel that a field guide should show the features of the bird that are most useful for identification. And so very often an artist will adjust the illustration, compensating for the angle, compensating for the light, so that the images are comparable, so that related species can be shown um, also with perhaps very distinctive poses or distinctive behaviors. And so I think for me, that combination of the artistic impression of the image um, and the portrayal of the behavior and the key features, that's something that is much easier to do with an artist than with uh, digital imagery. Interesting. So Carolyn Primus is saying, thanks for a wonderful talk, including the variety of islands and beautiful pictures of birds. Thank it, you very it much. Tr truly was wonderful, really wonderful. Makes us all want to, you know, get, take a trip to Japan. I don't know if we will, but it, it, it's on the bucket <laughs> list. <laughs> Great. So well, Mark, if, if you're going to go to Japan um, for birding, the first time, and you know, I've lived in Japan, but unfortunately, I I was not a birder then. But when is the if you were going to go, say, to Central Japan, to say Tokyo and environs, and where and and travel out from there, what 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 season would you recommend for starters? It's an, ex it's an extraordinarily difficult question to answer because Japan's avifauna includes resident species, but it also includes many significant winter visitors that are very attractive, but also many distinctive summer visitors that are very attractive. And you 
want to perhaps turn the question on the, you know, turn it on its head and ask, when shouldn't I come to Japan? And the key times to avoid are the golden week holidays in the sort of end of April and the first week of May. Indeed. Um, and then um, the rainy season, which can include sort of May into June um, and the autumn typhoon season. So um, the months that I recommend are June, well, May into June are fantastic. Um, March, actually from November, from now, from November to March are really excellent. There are times when you can also visit the, uh, the Izu Islands. Um, from the ferries, you can see three species of albatross. Um, and at that time of year, say March, you can also go down to the Nancy Shoto, the Southwest Islands, to look for the endemics. Um, but there is a very significant current focus on visiting Japan um, for birds and photography in February. Um, and I feel that I'm perhaps guilty of having triggered that, um, but that's there's a long backstory in there. Um, but the the key issue is if you're a photographer, and if you have to have an image of Stella's eagle on sea ice, then you can only do that um, if you're very lucky with weather conditions and ice movements. Um, you can only do that in perhaps very late January, early February to early March. Um, but if you don't like the extreme cold and you're not driven by that single image, then winter birding in Japan from November to March is absolutely fantastic. Summer birding, um, May and June, really good. Thank you. I, in other words, pretty much all the time, except for mm -hmm. rainy season and that crazy long, long yeah. weekend called Golden Week in, in late spring. Absolutely. And it's not great to be here over New Year, too, because that's a national holiday period during which many people travel home. And so um, accommodation and transport is um, crowded. Um, and unlike the 1980s, when I first started traveling in Japan, now there is um, a lot of tourism in Japan. Um, and so accommodation needs to be booked well in advance. So we have a question again from Suzanne Demeron. Hokkaido has a famous path along the East Coast, I think, that many haiku poets wrote about. Does it also, is it also a birding destination? I, I'm not sure that... It's Hokkaido, isn't that Honshu? I think um, Hokkaido that, Road. Yes, I think that may be Matsuo Basho's journey through the main island of Honshu. Main island, which would be yes. Honshu, yeah. Yeah, and there are certainly uh, many good birding uh, locations, but tying them to that journey to replicate that journey uh, would be rather difficult. You would have to do a lot of side branches to get to birding locations from from a hiking trail. Um, but Japan offers wonderful hiking uh, mountain trails. Um, but because of the nature of the Japanese islands, most trails go up and then they go down. <laughs> so <laughs> there are not many ridge trails um, and there are not many lowland trails. Um, so it's it's um, it's serious hiking. Yeah. But I would also like to say that Japan is an extremely safe country with wonderful railroads and the food is unbelievable. We Americans really need to learn good food, but Japanese, even in the country, everywhere, even Western food, it's fabulous. So I can't uh, recommend visiting Japan, period, enough. But then to add the birds to it, what what's not to love about Japan? And you've done a wonderful job of making that really obvious. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, there are some people who don't enjoy Japanese food and some people who don't enjoy seafood. But for everyone else, um, yes, Japanese uh, cuisine, it's um, it's world uh, heritage cuisine recognized by UNESCO. It's a um, wonderfully diverse and healthy cuisine because it's uh, it's driven by a concept of um food preparation 
based on what our bodies need, um, based on the season. So it's an artistic presentation. So yeah, don't get me started on Japanese food. <laughs> yes, it's brilliant. It's fantastic food. Um, and I think the safety issue is one that can't be um, overstressed. The uh, transport system runs precisely to the time uh, table and uh, is yes incredibly safe uh, of course um, there are elements of japan that are dangerous volcanoes <laughs> um, we have earthquakes <laughs> we have tsunami we have just about every known disaster and known to uh, humankind but as a society it would rank as the or perhaps one of the safest on earth um, so yes it's a, it's a fantastic uh, country to travel through um, travel with an open mind because the culture is vastly different um, everything can be different from sleeping and eating to bathing and traveling so but it's all yeah. wonderful i guarantee you <laughs> yes absolutely thank fantastic. you so much mark it's just been a wonderful wonderful event and thank you margie for finding mark that was really terrific mm -hmm. um, we have to get into our uh, business meeting before we lose our audience so um thank you again thank and, you so much uh, if you'll excuse me, then I will say farewell and thank you okay. very much and bye -bye. Uh, have a good meeting. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. So quickly, I put Dr. Brazil's website on. He had it on his slide. It was hard to see. JapanNatureGuides.com. Um, just want to remind you, we have a meet and greet coming up on Wednesday with master beekeeper Ashley Williams should be fascinating and fun. Um, and tickets are on sale for the holiday luncheon. So don't forget that. And you can go to the, oops, go to the website under registration and then special events. Mm -hmm. So um, John Thaxton is our speaker and it will sell out. It's, it's going fast actually. So hurry up and do that. And it's time to renew your dues. And with that in mind, um, you can go to the website and under our membership and um, and sign up. But we have a new donation store that just started up in the in the past week. So you, this um, donations, you will get a thank you for every donation that will include your tax information. This comes by email, and this email will also contain. Um, about your donation and your history beginning now. So for instance, in three years, you want to check how much you've given to Audubon, you can you go to the link and um, and it, it's going to keep track. So um, you can do recurring um, or not, and you can choose your recurring amount and timing. You can make a tribute donation, either honorary or memorial. Um, or any donation that you make. And if you would like someone to know you have done that, you just give us your email. And also you can choose to include the 3% processing fee, um, which ensures that 100% of your donation goes to the program you wanna donate to. So really exciting. And thanks to our webmasters, Betty and Barb for getting that all taken care of. Turning it over to Jean. Okay, hi everybody. Um, you all know about this Raymond Road Farm issue that we're having, and you can read about it more extensively in the Brown Pelican. What we are, uh, the Brown Pelican will give you a link and it'll show you exactly how, uh, what Audubon's position is with, with this. And also will allow you to, we want you to, um, send in an email to the county commissioners or your county commissioner. Uh, really, after you've read what um, is, uh, the developers are planning to do there, you might have some thoughts about it. And if you do, let your county commissioner know. Uh, to be continued, we'll let you know when it's uh, before the BOCC, the Board of County Commissioners, the live, um, pre uh, the live discussion. Um, on which the BCC does vote. So we will be there 
and uh, but we'll let you know what that date is. So uh, keep the, let's keep the pressure on because we don't want a. 171 homes just opposite the Raymond Road boardwalk. Absolutely not. Excuse my throat. I'm just coming off laryngitis, so I'm a little bit croaky. Um, so uh, just get onto the website and learn what you can, and uh, please uh, respond to the call for action. Uh, and the next slide, uh, Karen, do you have the financials up there? You're silent. You're muted. Now. I have to read. I'm going to try again. My okay. slides. Well, <clears throat> so I will try again here. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. So um, at the October meeting, um, a part of our bylaws indicate that we have to let you know how uh, our financial position for the year ended and our year ends at the end of uh, uh, end of May. So here. What I've done, I didn't want to reel out six pages of QuickBooks um, uh, figures. So I've collapsed this into um, total income, total expenses. Um, we had a budget. We were destined to lose $2,623 in our budget that we prepared for that year. And we actually ca uh, came out ahead by $876. So that's good. Our total income was 102,563. Our total expenses were 101,687. If any of you are interested in coming into the Nature Center and calling ahead, and we can go through the QuickBooks um, financials with you if you have an interest in that. We've always had open books for people to come and find out how, how we're spending the money and how we're getting the money. So uh, this is a very truncated look at it, but if you would like to um, look at them further in any detail, you can send an email to info at sarasotaaudubon.org and I or Andy, uh, the treasurer, will go over the numbers with you. So there we are, another year where we made it, we made it through. We squeaked through with a with an excess of $876, so that's good. <laughs> okay, All right. well, there we go. My voice is clapping out again, so. Okay, and next month we will have a really fun talk with the um, cartoonist that we feature at the end of the Brown Pelican for the last three years. Um, Rosemary Mosco will be talking to us um, about birds and cartoons, so. Join us. That'll be great. That'll be great. Okay. I can't wait for that. Yes. How she gets the inspiration for her cartoons from uh, from uh, birds is wonderful. Yeah. So, all right. This will be um, available online tomorrow if anyone missed it. Um, okay. See you all next Bye. time. Bye. Take care.